therapy department at UWC. Um, and uh, I've been interested in using technology in, uh, as part of my teaching since I started. Um, I did a master's degree where I looked at uh, how we use technology to support physiotherapy students in the country. Um, and it's just kind of grown from there. I'm, uh, I'm just finishing up my PhD at the moment. Um, and it, where I'm looking at you know, uh, similar things, how we use technology to improve specifically things that are relevant for, uh, for healthcare professionals. So clinical reasoning, critical thinking, problem solving, those kinds of, of things. Um, yeah, I've, I've been teaching for four years at, um, at UWC, and uh, yeah, I think that pretty much sums up what I'm doing here. Well, I love technology. Um, I, I love gadgets, I love the, the internet. Um, when I was a student, uh, actually also at UWC, it was late 90s, uh, this, you know, this whole internet thing was just starting. Um, a couple of friends and my, a couple of friends and I used to, uh, we had these kind of 28k modems, so very, very slow. Um, you know, downloading MP3s, the whole Napster thing was just starting. Um, websites, you know, at, at the time there were, there were no blogs or anything, you know, a couple of big companies had some websites and we uh, started making websites. I made a, a physiotherapy reference website. Um, and this was also all hand-coded, so you know, go and learn HTML so that you can uh, build a site. And um, ever since then, I've just been hooked on uh, on using technology, um, playing with it, um, and just seeing what I could do with it. So I've I've been interested in it for a very long time, and you know, been been interested in how it could potentially be used uh, in physiotherapy, um, and then. More, more recently in teaching. Um, so I think that technology uh, has a massive potential in, in education. Um, but I, I'm a bit concerned, I think a lot of people use technology in the wrong ways. Um, the big emphasis on technology in, in higher education has been on learning management systems. And uh, institutions have been throwing money um, at you know, that solution. And at the end of the day, a learning management system has nothing to do with learning. It's a, it's a content management system, it's a student management system, maybe a course management system, but there's, there's very little about learning. Um, in you know, the, the kind of standard conception of a, of a learning management system. Um, I, I think that the, um, the potential for technology in education is um, to, to change the way that we communicate with people. Um, you know, learning is about, it's about discussion, it's about engaging with ideas, um, it's a social activity and, you know, there's a lot of uh, theory that exists about, that explains how people learn. And when you start looking at that, you realize that, you know, one of the best ways that people really come to a deep understanding of, of abstract knowledge, of, of theoretical concepts, is through talking about those things with other people. Um, and I say talking, but it could be reading other people's writing or watching videos or interpreting an image. Um, and I think that this is where the real potential of technology is. Uh, it's to change the way that we communicate with other people. We have uh, richer forms of communication with online tools. Um, we can displace conversations in time and space, so a conversation that you know, we could have over a very long period. We could have a conversation over months. Um, it just depends on when people access that narrative, whether it's a, a text, that a piece of text that sits on the internet, or, or a picture that somebody has uploaded, or, you know, whatever. And I think that is, is really where we need to be focusing our attention. Um, so we use technology in, in our classrooms um, in a couple of ways. Uh, maybe the, the, the most superficial way is that we, uh, we allow students, we encourage students to bring their own devices to the classroom. So there's laptops, tablets, phones, everything is out um, and students are using that all the time. Um, we wanted to be very clear with the students that uh, the way that they access information, the way that they access knowledge is a hugely important part of their learning. Um, and in the past we kind of had these policies where there's no technology, you don't, you don't take your laptop out, we wouldn't even allow students to take notes on their laptop. 
And, you know, over the last couple of years, we've been trying to figure out, you know, why? Why is this a, a problem? I know as an academic, I access information on the computer all the time. Uh, it's my primary way of learning. And yet we say to our students, no, you don't, you don't get to do that. Um, in this time, in this place, you, you don't get to use computers, you don't get to use the internet, you don't get to share with other people. And we kind of questioned that and we said, well, you know, how can we, how can we change that? How can we break down those boundaries? So when you walk into one of our classes, there's, you know, students have their phones out, they have their laptops out. Um, then we, uh, we, we had to teach them how to, how to find information. We had to teach them how to find credible sources of information. So we had to teach them how to evaluate online sources. So we did that and you know now the students use the internet as a major source of information. Um, they also construct their notes online. So we use Google Docs, uh, which is now Google Drive. Um, everyone in the class has uh, an account on Drive. Uh, the students work in small groups and they collaboratively build their content up using, um, using documents or uh, we also use presentation, the slideshow feature of, of Google Drive. Um, so I think uh, those are the main ways that we get students interacting with content. In terms of communication, because remember I said, you know, it's learning is about interacting with people as well as interacting with content. So we've got the interaction with content down. Um, we also have a social network that we run in our department. Um, it's, a, it's, it's on a private server, it's, um, it's not public facing, so everything that happens in that social network is private to our department. Um, and that's where we share, we share information um, with the students. So we say, you know, here's something that you might find useful um, in terms of your learning, but we also share experiences. So when the students go out on clinical placements, they used to write a reflection in a, uh, in a diary and they would include that in a clinical file that they would submit at the end of the term. Now we have the students writing their reflections as blog posts um, on the day that it happens or within the next couple of days. And then we give feedback on, on those reflections. So rather than getting a massive amount of feedback at the end of your block, just before you move to another block where that feedback may no, no longer be relevant, we give them feedback in almost real time um, about their clinical experiences. So we use the social network for communication, um, for um, sharing clinical experiences, for sharing different perspectives, um, challenging biases. So, you know, when students say, I went here and it was a waste of time. And we say, okay, well, what was it specifically that made you think of it was a waste of time? We try and get them to articulate their experience and then you know, through questioning, try and get them to evaluate it in a different way or to reflect further. Um, so our use of technology is very much driven by uh, outcomes that, um, you know, we want to see as, a, as practicing physiotherapists. We're not using technology because whatever it is, is, is cool at the moment. At the moment, they use it just for the, the module that, that we're busy with. Um, if there are private groups, then they can make those groups private and invisible to us. So we've given them control over the environment. Um, so if they want to have a private group that we are not aware of, then they can do that. So those groups may exist. I doubt that they do. Um, the, for Google Drive, we've actually found that the students are saying that they use it a lot. They use it in other subjects, in other classes. Um, and the biggest advantage is that they have to do group work, you know, outside of this module. Some of them live on campus, some of them live, you know, far away. And, you know, now they actually do their assignments, some of their assignments, uh, using Google Drive. Okay, so this module uh, that we're making the changes in is called Applied Physiotherapy. It's um, basically the, the module where we try and explore some of the more common conditions that patients would present with in a South African context that physiotherapists might be expected to manage. So, you know, they, they're quite diverse. They cover a range of, of different problems um, from, you know, patients who have had strokes to fractures to respiratory conditions um, 
and what we do is we we mix up those conditions in you know common uh, ways that are commonly uh, um, found in patient presentations so in South Africa patients who have HIV are also probably going to have TB so we don't teach it to the students this is HIV this is TB we say you know in a South African context these two conditions go together uh, we find that in patients who um, are on TB medication they often present with something called peripheral neuropathy which is a neuro neurological condition so we, we mix those things together. Um, in the past, the, this module was taught with lectures. We split everything up into categories. We would talk about, you know, th these are the orthopedic conditions, and then we list them. And then the students must go and they must learn all of those things. And, uh, you know, now we've broken that down completely. We don't do lectures. It's, everything is student-generated. Um, and we have, we have quality assurance processes where we have facilitators in the classroom who are actually making sure that the students are gathering the, the content that is relevant for the module, um, but that also that they're hitting the, the major objectives that, that we want them to hit. So we guide them in that direction. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just a free-for-all where we say, you know, everything is happiness and light and the students will just magically learn wonderful things by themselves. There's a lot of guidance and support. We decided to use Google uh, Docs because um, I've, I've actually run a couple of pilot projects as part of my research and uh, when we did, we used the wiki initially and uh, what we found is that the students would complain because they couldn't really collaboratively work on the document. Um, well, not in real time anyway. So if, if you're editing the document, then when I come there it says, I can't edit it because someone else is editing it at that time. And what we really wanted to do is we wanted students to be able to, in the classroom, have three or four of them looking at the same document and being able to work on it in real time together. So the wiki didn't really work out for us. We also found that we couldn't give good feedback to the students using a wiki. You'd have to embed a comment in the text um, uh, where the students were working and make it a different color or write your name there. Uh, we tried using the discussion um, tab in uh, we used media wiki has a discussion tab so you can have a discussion kind of in the background um, of a document and then it was difficult because you'd have to say in paragraph two sentence three whereas with Google Drive you can um, actually block off whole sections of text and make a comment that's relevant to that section of text that's dated the version control in Google Drive is really good so you can roll back the document to a previous version, you can see who's making what changes, at what times. Um, so, uh, and you know, um, if we're running a wiki, um, you know, we have to, we have to run that process. We have to maintain it. Um, Google maintains Google Drive, and you know, there's absolutely no chance of Google Drive going down. Um, so they have rolling backups, which make sure that nothing is ever lost. Um, so I think there are a lot of technical reasons uh, as well as um, uh, features that drove us towards using Google Drive. Um, well, no, they, they, if we, we think of Google, uh, the, the document as their case notes. So we do case-based learning. So uh, we give the students a case and then based on some of the variables that are introduced in the case, it stimulates them to then go and do research and ask questions. So their case notes it sits on Google Drive and they can do whatever they want in there. They can write whatever they want, they can use it as a scratch pad or notepad, um, or they can make it their more formal documentation of their process through or progress through the case. Um, we provide input in terms of saying, okay, well, this is a really major concept, you need to flesh this out, uh, you need a better reference, this source isn't really a, a credible source. Um, or we can say, look, this is a minor concept, move this to the end. Um, it's not really the focus of what we're looking at for this case, but you may find it valuable at a later stage. So we do, we structure uh, what information the students are gathering. Um, but remember that, you know, Google Drive is just the place where they gather content. Um, they must engage with content. They have to find sources online, evaluate them, summarize them, synthesize them with other sources. 
So there's a lot of information management going on. So it's not just the place where they copy and paste content. Um, and then we, we provide input um, in the form of questions mainly, um, or we direct them to other sources and things like that. So it, it really is the students' environment. They can write whatever they want, and then we provide inputs on whether or not that's relevant for the case. Because at the end of the day, we still have to assess them on, on the case. Um, so a big, a, a big part of this process was actually getting feedback from students. And we had more formal feedback uh, because I was studying the process. So we had focus group sessions, uh, one or two surveys. Um, and you know those we kind of wrote up formally as publications. We also uh, got feedback from students um, regularly. So we would always be asking them, what do you think, what are you struggling with? We try to create a space in the, in the classroom where questioning was encouraged, that any kind of question was a good question. So, you know, the, the most common question when we started was, why do we have to do it this way? Um, they really resisted the process. Um, I, I would go so far as to say they hated it. Um, and, uh, and us for, for making them do all this work. Um, and one of the students that came out in a focus group said, I like going to go sit in the back of the classroom and switching off. I like not having to pay attention. And, you know, they, you know they've, got, they've had 12 years of experience of being passive. And, you know, they sit in the class and they, they just listen to what you have to say. And um, then it comes to exams and then they memorize as much as they can. And we know that that doesn't really lead to any kind of uh, real learning. So what we do in the classroom is we actually, we force them to engage, and force is a, not such a nice word, but let's say that we create opportunities in which they will be unable to be successful if they don't engage with the, the, the content and with each other. And they resisted that. They really uh, didn't enjoy it. They, um, you know, because thinking is hard, and uh, they, they've had 12 years of experience that uh, says that not thinking is a successful strategy. It must be successful because they got into the physiotherapy program. So why should we change that? And um, it's taken us, I'd say, about eight months. Eight months of resisting students, resisting colleagues, um, and, uh, and now the students are starting to come up to us and saying, you know what, I get it. I, I understand what you're trying to do. And, um, and that's very rewarding. Um, but, you know, we'd encourage them to... We started a, a, a document on Google Drive saying student feedback. And we encouraged them to just go on there and post, you know, whatever they wanted. And most of it was along the lines of, just give me the content. Just give me... Just tell me what I have to know. I don't care about this thinking. Um, just give me the content. And then, you know, we'd, we'd have to try and say, well, you know, that doesn't really lead to good understanding. It's not going to make you a better physiotherapist. And, and they were not interested in hearing any of that. Um, but we, we tried to listen to them. We made lots of changes in the module based on student feedback. So we, we did say to them, look, we value your feedback and we will make changes that, um, you know, that, that are relevant for the module, relevant for your learning. But we made certain design choices that were based on, based on research, based on learning theory, um, that we weren't going to change, um, and you know they they still they still resist those, those things. So it's not all, it's not all positive. Uh, we made the outcomes more explicit. So in the past, uh, we would we'd say that you know by the end of this module, students have to be able to, you know, describe these conditions, uh, describe patient management from a physiotherapy perspective. And so what we did now is we, we kind of split the, uh, the outcomes into knowledge, skills, um, uh, attributes, and um, what's the other one? Ethics. So the knowledge and skills were covered by the previous uh, description of the outcomes. And we kind of fleshed those out a little bit, made them a little bit more explicit. Um, 
But then we added the graduate attributes, um, and these are um, kind of institutional, uh, it's an institutional policy document where they're saying that, you know, a UWC graduate should be. So it's not uh, profession specific. Um, and basically these are generic attributes or characteristics or features of a student that we kind of say we want our students to be these kinds of people. And they're things like, you know, citizenship, um, being, a, being aware of their kind of social responsibility, um, being a lifelong learner, um, being someone who's critical, who's thoughtful. Uh, so they're things that aren't really specific to any particular profession, but which we really value a lot in, in, our, in our profession. So we incorporated some outcomes that included the graduate attributes, and then we also included ethical outcomes uh, in terms of how we want students to be with patients. So it's not enough that a student knows what to do and when to do, but they also need to be able to deal with a patient on a human level. They need to be able to respect, be, be respectful of patients. You know, we'd see students in the past, and this is not, this is not a, a UWC problem or a South African problem. This is a, a problem with training young people to be healthcare professionals all over the world. You know, how do you, um, you know, we, we spend so much time focusing on the, the technical skills, the knowledge, um, knowing what to do, knowing when to do it, but we spend very little time actually focusing on dealing with this other person as a human being. And so our students think that all that they need to do to get this person better is, you know, I need to do this mobilization on this joint for this many times, um, or I need to tell the exercise, I need to tell the patient, do these exercises, and they will go and do it. And uh, what we never took into, well, <laughs> we, we do take this into account, but students struggle to, to deal with that because, you know, I'm telling you what to do and you don't do it, therefore, it's not my problem, it's your problem. And we actually need students to see that the reason that the patient doesn't want to do your exercise program is because they're depressed or because they're nauseous and they want to throw up the whole time that you know, they're busy with you. And to be understanding of that, um, to be able to take that into consideration when you're working with your patient. And for a second year, that's difficult because a second year just wants to know what must I do, when must I do it. They're still focusing on the the very technical aspects of the profession. Um, and so we felt it was really important to bring in those ethical components. I know it's a very long-winded response to, to your question, but um, it, we, we kind of had very, uh, very kind of deep-seated reasons for wanting to make these changes. And of course, when you change outcomes, that means now you have to go and change your content, you have to change your way of teaching, you have to change your way of assessing. Um, so we, you know, it really wasn't just a, an exercise on paper. Um, we, we restructured this entire module um, to take into account some of the changes that we'd made. The net generation, they don't exist. So <laughs> one of the things that you read about is that, you know, young people these days, they know technology, they understand it and they're comfortable with it. Um, if they are, then our students do not fit into that group. And, you know, there's actually a lot of research that's coming out now that really disproves the, the whole net generation thing. But the, a lot of people that I've spoken to, a lot of colleagues, academics, kind of have this impression that young people just, they just get technology. And, um, you know, I did some research early on in this process and students use technology, but they don't understand it. They don't understand privacy. They don't understand um, online identity. They don't understand, you know representation of themselves. They don't understand the lines between personal and professional, which are blurred in online spaces. So, you know, they, they may use Facebook, but they don't use it intentionally. Um, when they do use it for their learning, they use it for administration. So sharing information about tests, uh, due dates for assignments. But there's very little real learning that happens uh, in, in places like Facebook. Um, so in order to, one of the first things we had to do was we had to get the students familiar with the technology. Uh, because the last thing you want is for the technology to get in the way of the learning. The technology needs to be invisible. It needs to be that thing that is just there, like pen and paper, like a blackboard, um, like a presentation. 
So we actually spent a lot of time in the beginning providing an enormous amount of support for students uh, in terms of improving their understanding of how the technology works. And this was, it was really, in some cases, very simple, like just saying the, to the student, you need to go and click on this button and then everything will be fine, to uh, setting up, helping them set up Google accounts with non-Gmail uh, Gmail email addresses, um, to explaining um, how to use Google Drive. So even though the interface looks a lot like Word, there was just a conceptual block where the students were just like, I don't know how to use this thing. And you say, but it, it looks like Word. There's the bold icon, there's the italic icon. And there was something about it being online and being able to be seen by others that really just it blocked the students from, from participating. They were halfway through the year, I had half the class tell me um, they didn't know what the social network was for. They didn't go there because there was nothing, they didn't see that there was any value there. Some of them didn't even know that it existed. In all the chaos at the beginning of the year, they hadn't really clicked that there was this other place where we were sharing content. We were posting videos and we record, we record practical demonstrations in class upload that to YouTube and then embed that video clip into a, a page in the social network. So we th we're thinking, man, we're really giving these, these students so much support and so much help and information. And the students are sitting there thinking, man, there's nothing going on. Like it's, it's just us. We're here by ourselves. Um, so just kind of getting it, helping them get it kind of in their heads, you know, what spaces are for what tasks, where to go for resources. They'd, you know, they'd say to me, I don't know how to get hold of you. I'd say, I'm, I'm here, <laughs> you can talk to me. Or, Here's my, my email address is out there. And they're like, no, I thought that I had to contact you through the social network. You know, just weird things that we'd never ever thought to try and um, you know, prevent happen because we never thought it, it would ever happen. Um, so the, there were a lot of things around the technology that cropped up that we didn't expect and, you know, we didn't even conceive might be problems. Um, I'd like for the learning management system to be blocked off to lecturers um, so that the learning management system should be operated by administrators um, or lecturers who actually understand that delivering content to students more efficiently is not the same as helping them to learn. Um, I'd like to see lecturers become a little bit more interested in technology um, and start using it in ways that are really innovative. One of the things that uh, someone in my department did that I thought was fantastic is we do something called electrotherapy. Um, which is we basically have a couple of very expensive machines that can be used as part of treatment. Now when you've got a class of 80 students it becomes difficult to actually have a lot of time with these machines. So what the lecturer did was she took photographs of every machine and then annotated the photograph so that the, the students would be able to look at the photograph and be able to understand what the, the interface to the machine was before actually getting to the machine. So you could say, you know, this knob is for this, the, this is the power switch, and then number them. So this is the progression of how you, you start by turning it on, then you do this. And so she'd share that, that picture with everyone. And it sounds simple, um, but it's, it's one way where she was thinking, how can I use technology in a way that really helps the students? And it is just a small thing, but I'd really like to see more people trying to do things like that, where they identify a problem in their classroom and say, is there something that's kind of digital, online, something about technology that will make this a little bit a little bit simpler, a little bit easier, a little bit more efficient. That's a good place to start. From there you can start building and, and growing and you know you want to get to a point where you can actually use technology in a way to change, to fundamentally change how you engage with students, um, how you communicate with them, how you uh, discuss experiences with them, but you can start off with some really, really simple ideas. 
So I'd like to see people kind of starting to own that domain um, rather than saying, well, oh, it's digital stories. Well, that's ICS. That's, you know, the, or I, I, need to, I need some content that I can share with my students on the internet. Um, let's go to the e-learning division. You know, I'd, I'd like to see some lecturers starting to say, well, you know, I want to learn more about how this stuff works so that I can be more efficient, uh, more effective. Um, and start off small. Um, you know, these are not changes. You don't have to change the world overnight, but everyone can make a small change to their teaching practice. Um, you know, just a small, a small change that uh, you can build on every year. But I think the important thing to note is that identify the problem and then see what's out there that you can use to solve the problem. I think some people say, well, blogs, blogs are, blogs are cool right now. Let's, uh, let me make an assignment where I can use blogs, um, which isn't, it's kind of going, going around, going, it's approaching the problem from the wrong direction. Um, identify a need, a learning need um, in collaboration with students um, and then uh, identify a technology that you could use to help solve that problem. In South Africa, unfortunately, I think that they're going to look very much the same. I think you're going to have big lecture theatres and uh, the primary use of technology is going to be to deliver content more efficiently. Um, what I'd like to see is uh, people using technology in ways that are much less teacher-centred and more student-centred. So doing things like allowing students to bring in their own devices, not just allowing it, but encouraging it. Um, making use of sources that are different to the teacher's notes that are presented as a PowerPoint presentation. A lot of people think that embedding a video into their PowerPoint presentation is you know, the epitome of, of progress. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's a good place to start. If you're going from an overhead projector, then, you know, Moving to a, a slideshow presentation is a big step. Uh, you can embed video in it. Um, you, know, you can have links where you can click a link in your presentation. It takes you to an outside source. But rather than the, the teacher controlling that process, I'd like to see situations where the teacher is facilitating the students engaging with that process. So, you know, the teacher stands in front of the class and the teacher decides the, the speed, the progression that you move through the module. Um, it's very linear, you move from one point to the next. The teacher has to make all sorts of assumptions about the level of the learners. They should all be at the same place. Um, whereas if we can create spaces where the students can engage with content um, in their own ways, in ways that are meaningful for them, to answer questions that, that they derive in order to fill gaps in their own knowledge that they have identified, um, then I think we'll be able to see some really innovative and uh, you know, fundamentally different uh, ways of using technology in, in teaching and learning. But as long as the teacher is controlling the process, um, I don't see a whole lot changing. I think students are capable of figuring out way more interesting things uh, to do with technology than, than we are. Um, because they, they know what they need. You know, they'll say, well, there's this thing I don't understand. How how can I, I need to understand it, how can I understand it better? Um, so I'd like to see a de decentralization of power, um, and I think technology can help with that. Um, whether or not lecturers are willing to give up that control in the classroom and shift some of that power balance to students, I think is a different question. Um, I think a lot of lecturers are not even uh, trying to engage with that question at the moment um, and I think it's going to be something we're going to be struggling with for a while. Well I mean we're, we're a professional degree so uh, you know we have uh, the Health Professions Council of South Africa they they audit our content so all physiotherapy programs in the country basically offer the same degree that's approved by the HPCSA so in terms of our content the, that's pretty much decided for us. In terms of teaching strategy um, in our department we have enormous um, flexibility um, from the head of department um, you know, to, say, to say, well, do whatever you want. Um, 
you know the module outcomes, you know the content that you have to cover, you know the major concepts that you have to cover. Do whatever you want, but just talk about it with a couple of other people before you make any radical changes. So we've got a very flexible policy in the department. And basically what we do is, you know, we have a couple of people sit down and say, I'd like to try this. Um, does anyone have any experience with that? Um, anything that you'd like to share? What did you learn? What did you struggle with? So we talk about things a lot. Um, so that's just the context. So in terms of teaching strategies, we can make any changes that we want. Um, for this particular module, I did about three years of research um, before we actually made any changes in the module. So because it was a PhD project, um, you know, that, that explains why a lot of the research happens, but I was also very acutely aware that you make big changes in a module, uh, you know, it's, it's, not just my, it's not just my research that's at stake. I've got 60, 60 kids in the class who are kind of depending on us to, to help them be better physios. So um, we did an enormous amount of research before we, before we made any of these changes. Um, there was no, no decision in the department around this module was made by a single person. So everything was done, I wouldn't say by committee, but we would have a meeting to discuss any changes that needed to be made. Um, so we wanted to be very clear that there wasn't a single person who was making any changes. Uh, so it was very much a collaborative process from, from the start. Students were involved in changes as well as lecturers all the way up to the head of department. Oh, I think, yeah, I think there's, I mean, it's a, it's a big question. I think there's a lot, there's a lot to talk about. So in terms of the, I guess, the resources that are available for, for teachers who are interested in using technology, you know, there's a, a lot of people who are blogging about this at the moment. So educational technology is a huge subject. Um, and you just need to go, uh, you can just start with a couple of, a couple of uh, blog, going to Google Reader, educational technology, teaching with technology, technology enhanced learning. You know, read a couple of those, you'll see that they make reference to other people. And over time, you start building up a, a kind of a collection of people who are blogging about this. Um, Twitter is another great resource. Um, but like, like with anything on the internet, you have to develop your own filters. So you're going to start following people on Twitter. And after a couple of months, you're going to start thinking, I'm really not interested in you know what your dog had for breakfast and you know that sort of thing. So then you unfollow those people, and again over time, you start getting better at filtering um, what information is coming to you, uh, whether it's on Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter, um, uh, RSS feeds. Um, th there's an enormous amount of content, but you need to filter it and kind of narrow down the focus of, of what information is coming into you. Um, we're actually looking at uh, iPads and mobile devices in the department for some of our students who have visual and hearing disabilities. Um, we are trying to look at ways that we can make adjustments to how we teach um, to uh, to make it more inclusive rather than them having to change. We're trying to figure out, is there any way that we can change? We're looking at iPads at the moment, mainly in terms of how they interact with content. Um, there are no specific apps that I would say, yes, these are, these are things that you should be paying attention to. Um, but in terms of having access to, to content, um, in terms of being able to record things, take photos of things. Um, I think that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk around iPads at the moment in higher education. And at the moment, my money's more on uh, phones. Um, there's every, in, my, in my opinion, that everything that you can do with an iPad, you could do more conveniently with a phone. Um, if you think that it's going to be about reading lots of content, that's about the only way that an iPad is better than a phone. Um, so I think there's a lot of hype around mobile in higher education at the moment. 
I really do believe that it has the potential, mobile has the potential to, to fundamentally change teaching and learning in terms of moving interactions outside the classroom environment. But as long as we're looking at them as uh, portals to content, I don't know if it really changes a whole lot. You know, if, if I'm just looking at a, a page on Wikipedia, does it matter if I'm looking at it through my laptop? Or my iPad. My iPad's a little bit easier and less unwieldy, but you know, fundamentally that doesn't change anything. Um, I think the real potential in mobile is is in changing how we engage with other people and how we engage with content. Um, yeah. Okay. So in terms of things that I use myself, um, I spend a lot of time on using an app called Mendeley. Um, Mendeley's uh, it's cross-platform. Runs on Linux, Mac. Uh, Windows, it runs on your iPad, it runs on your Android device, uh, it's web-based and basically if you're an academic um, it's a way for you to manage all of your research papers. So if you've got a library of a thousand papers and you're looking for that one idea that was in that one paper and you've got them in a folder and they're all named X37JY5, um, you know, that's a problem. Um, Mendeley helps you sort all of that information. Um, it automatically extracts metadata from the, from the article, renames the file so that it, all of your files are author, year of publication, title of publication. Um, and if you're an academic, just having that kind of ability to manage your, your library is uh, is fantastic. If I if I add a PDF to my computer at work, when I get home and turn on my iPad, that PDF is on my iPad. Um, so there's none of this, you know, walking around with a flash drive trying to remember which article is on which computer or on which device. And uh, so Mendeley is something something that I use an enormous um, amount. Um, it's difficult to pick out online sources that are particularly useful. Uh, not, not that there aren't any that are particularly useful, but it's difficult to narrow it down. Um, there are a couple of people who I follow who they don't write often, but when they write, I pay a lot of attention to what they say. Then you get other people, um, someone like you know Stephen Downs, who is prolific online, um, and he kind of gives really thoughtful, insightful little comments about things that he finds all over the web. So. You know, if you're interested in educational technology, then someone like Stephen Downs is an invaluable resource. Um, yeah, um, I'm trying to think of any. There's a guy called George Kuros. Who, you know, these are just bloggers. They they're more than bloggers. You know, they are very kind of highly respected and and high up in their fields, but they blog. Um, Terry Anderson is another person. Um, George Siemens. Um, so you know that there, there there are people who a lot of people blog. I pay attention to some more than others. Um, but I think to to narrow it down to a small subset um, is kind of limiting yourself, because you get. You get, you know, some kindergarten teacher in, you know, St. Louis, Missouri, who, you know, tries something interesting in her classroom. And it's not a big deal, and she doesn't have a PhD, and, you know, in terms of, you know, that wow factor, it's not coming from a, a so-called big name. But she may try something in her classroom, and I think, damn, that is awesome. I'm, I'm going to give that a go. So I think that's the... For me, that's the, the main power of the internet, is the kind of serendipity of finding things that you weren't looking for, um, but which do emerge over time once you kind of realize, or once you figure out how to manage your filters, how to figure out who to follow, where the conversations are happening. And, you know, these things come up that you weren't expecting. And those are the things that really have the potential to change how you teach um, in a classroom. So I don't, I don't want to narrow it down to any particular thing, but um, there, there are so many uh, useful tools out there.
Uh, I'm very excited about augmented reality. Um, so augmented reality is just a, a digital overlay on the physical world. So you you have either a device in your hand like a phone, um, or you know Google is Google and many other people actually are developing uh, augmented reality systems that are wearable. I think wearable computing might be a, another way of looking at it. Um, embedding uh, devices um, within what you wear and it could be a pair of glasses or it could be something in your clothes uh, but I, I think for me it's all a, a lot about augmented reality uh, in terms of what you can see um, so I, I'm very excited about the possibility of students being able to walk around hospitals and being alerted to uh, potentially useful uh, pieces of information like um, you know, that you don't necessarily think of as a teacher. So you can digitally tag objects or places um, within a hospital. And as the student is walking through the hospital, the, the device knows where it is. Uh, you can say that this is a second year student. This is the level of information that the student should be exposed to. So they don't necessarily need to, um, you know, know about uh, a lot that's going on in the ICU because we only really start looking at that with our fourth year students. But a second year student is really only starting to learn about x-rays. So that, that's just an example. So I'd love to be able to put up an x-ray and to have digital information overla overlaid on the x-ray. So if a student needs more assistance in terms of identifying structures, then that could be exposed to just that student, while another student could be at a different point, and that student could have different information exposed to them. So you'd have different levels of, of information and content being uh, sent to different people depending on their particular personal context. Um, and and I, I mean, that's going to require an enormous amount of back-end infrastructure and uh, development. But I, I also think that a lot of this stuff is going to become automated. Um, uh, and you know, computers are going to be able to, or they're going to get better at figuring out what to show different people at, who are at different stages of their development. Um, you know, imagine walking up to a patient and the physiotherapist sees all the patient's information overlaid next to the patient. Um, but that information is different to what the, docs, the doctor sees. Um, so, you know, we can, you can start thinking of some, some really, really powerful applications um, of, of tagging the real world with uh, digital tags um, and then being able to expose that content to different people in different ways. Um, student arrives at a place like Ritzke at day one and, you know, it's a massive institution and they don't know where the physio department is. So, you know, they have their augmented reality glasses and it says follow the blue line, you know. Um, where's the nurse's station? Who's the, most in, who's the most senior person on the ward? Put a little red dot over their head. You know, there's an infinite number of ways that you could make a system like that very useful to, to students who are trying to learn a particular environment or particular context. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about the possibility for augmented reality.